Uh, would you please turn in your Bibles or on your phone, whatever you like best, uh, to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, and our passage this morning is going to be verses 18 to 30, so Romans 8, and we'll be at starting in uh, 18 to 30 here in just a few moments. Now, if you were new with us today, we've been in this series looking at Romans chapter 8. It's a wonderful chapter. Uh, many believers, it's their favorite chapter in the entire Bible. And uh, this is a good Sunday to be here if you are new, because the topic today is this, how we can have hope in the midst of suffering, the hope that we can have when we suffer, when we go through those hardships in life. And this is such a, a relevant topic, because no matter who you are, at some point in your life or seasons in your life, you will go through suffering. But yet, in the midst of those difficulties, we can still have hope. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a man named uh, Bart Ehrman, but he is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. Uh, he's a world-renowned expert on the New Testament and early Christianity. Uh, he is an atheist, and uh, he's been very critical of Christianity and been very influential, particularly in his college setting of, of being influential and in, in bringing people away from the faith. Many freshmen show up on the University of North Carolina's campus, and because of his, you know, just being so critical of Christianity, many of them abandon the faith. Now, given that he doesn't believe in God, it's not that surprising that he would be critical in his scholarship of the Bible. But what may surprise you is that in adulthood, up into his 30s, he considered himself a Christian, and he says he actually believed in the traditional biblical God. Now, what he means by this is that God is not remote and distant, that God is active in our world, that God loves people, that God hears prayers and answers those prayers. But then as he continued in his uh, walk with God, he got to a point where he says this, there was a major shift in his life. But I had come very much to doubt that any such God existed. And it was the problem of suffering that had created these doubts, and that eventually led me to doubt it so much that I simply no longer believed it. He continues, I got to a point where I just didn't believe it anymore. This wasn't because I was a biblical scholar who knew that the Bible was deeply flawed as a very human book, filled with contradictions, discrepancies, and mistakes. All that, he says, was irrelevant. What was relevant was the very heart of the Christian claim that God loves his people, that he answers their prayers and intervenes when they are in need. I came to think there was no such God and decided that I had no choice but to abandon my faith and leave the Christian tradition. Now, what he says about the Bible having contradictions, as a church, we would disagree with him on that. There are some really great answers when it comes to the seeming contradictions in the Bible and how they're actually not contradictions at all. But that's a different sermon. I want you to hear what he's saying. This is a biblical scholar, a, a world-renowned biblical scholar. And it wasn't his scholarship and these supposed contradictions and mistakes in the Bible that led him away from faith. What led him away from faith was the suffering that he saw and experienced. This is what drew him away. But you know, he's not alone in this. This issue of suffering is one of the top reasons, maybe the number one reason that people stop believing in God. They struggle with all the suffering that they see in the world, the suffering that they experience, and it's too much for them, and so they leave the faith. Now, maybe for you, if we kind of put suffering on a spectrum, on that far end, that's not you in as far as leaving the faith, such as Bart Ehrman and so many others, but yet you are still struggling of how to think and comprehend suffering. I mean, have you ever thought this, that as a follower of Jesus, okay, a child of God, that, that you would avoid suffering? I mean, last week we, we looked at those great truths that we were by nature children of wrath. We had rejected and rebelled against God, but yet in his love for us, when we put our faith in Christ, we are adopted into God's family. We are secure. But wouldn't that mean that we wouldn't have to deal with suffering? What about this? 
I must have done something wrong. When the difficulties and the trials come, don't, don't we kind of default to that, that surely there's something. We begin to think in our life, okay, I did these things, I did these sins, this is why I'm now suffering. But that's not new with us. If you go to the Old Testament book of Job, Job was this man that was considered righteous. He had done nothing wrong, but yet he endured tremendous suffering. His kids were killed. He lost his wealth. His body was afflicted. And his friends, his supposed friends, they show up and, and they kind of sit with him for a while, but then they begin to speak. And what they tell Job is, Job, you had to have done something wrong. There has to be some major sins in your life. This is why you are suffering. And Job kept telling them over and over again, no, I've not done anything sinful. They wouldn't listen to him. And Job was right. Another is this, I must not have enough faith. Now I'm going to share a story, a little bit of the story that I heard uh, about 10 years ago or so. And it was just heartbreaking to hear this. And it, it relates to this in that this young uh, wife, she was pregnant, and she had a miscarriage. And someone in her church was sharing with her, because she's pouring out her heart, how heartbroken she is. And someone in her re church responded to her and said, this happened to her because she didn't have enough faith. Now, why would you say that to anybody? But that was the conclusion of this person. Now, we may not, not go... Uh, to quite that extreme. But yet we think sometimes I don't have enough faith and this is why I suffer. But if that is the criteria, we are all in trouble. And so Paul, who has been showing us these great blessings that we have in Christ, he knows that there's going to be an issue when it comes to the, the continued struggle that we have with suffering. How we think we're God's children and maybe we should avoid it. But Paul is saying, no, there will be suffering in your life. But even though you will experience some hard times, yet in the midst of that, there is hope. Amen. That as followers of Jesus, we will suffer. But we have hope. And he, he provides hope in three areas that we'll look at. But before we get, that, get there, we need to look at the present reality of our suffering. See, Paul doesn't just kind of move quickly past that. And so Paul, he begins by addressing the present reality when it comes to our world. And what he does is he personifies creation. It's interesting how he does this. In Romans 8, verse 19, for example, he says this, for the creation waits in eager expectation, just like we would eagerly expect. Verse 20 says, for creation was subject to frustration. Verse 22, the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. See, Paul, he gives this very vivid picture of a woman in the pains of childbirth. And maybe you've experienced that one. Having three kids of my own, I've been in that labor room, and I know this, I wanted to leave, all right? That was a crazy scene. I didn't sign up for that one. And I'll be honest, our first child took like 10 hours, which I know in the grand scheme is, is fairly short. But for 10 hours, I was basically no help. I was providing encouraging words such as, you've got this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> breathe. Hey, your mom's here. Can I go wait in the lobby? You know, things like that. But I made it through. You ladies are tough. I'll give you that. But it's not just creation that is groaning. As followers of Jesus, we also groan. So we long for things to be made right. We see the brokenness, we see the evil, the injustice, the suffering, and we long for it to end. But this does raise a question, why are things the way they are? Why are things broken? See, the Bible's answer to this question, if you look at the screen, there's this diagram, is it didn't start out this way. See, God's design, we find this in the early pages of the Bible, that God creates our world, and it is, he says, very good. No suffering. Our relationship with God is the way it should have been. Our relationship with other people was the way it should have been. But though, but through sin, we, we rejected God. We rebelled against God. We wanted to go our own way. And because of this, our world is broken. 
The language that we sometimes use is that we live in a fallen world. And so there's frustrations, there's suffering. We think of things of disasters in our world, such as tornadoes and flooding and earthquakes. This is creation groaning. We also have our own frustrations. I mean, at work, you put in the effort for that project, and then it falls through. You know, teenagers, maybe you waiting for that car, you finally get that car, and then a month later, it breaks down. You know, you got to wait longer. Maybe teenagers in, in school, you have those relationships. You finally get to that point where I have friends, but then those relationships kind of fall apart. You clean the house, right, parents? Clean the house. We finally did it. Then you turn around five minutes later, and it's just a disaster. You're like, what happened? And so we have these frustrations, but on a much more serious note, this is why there's pain in our world. This is why we have health issues This is why our loved ones die, and then one day, ultimately, we will die. But God, in his mercy, sends his son, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. The gospel just means the good news, the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And see, there's an individual aspect to the gospel, but also a corporate aspect. Individually, Christ, he comes to this earth, and he lives a perfect, sinless life. He goes to the cross as our substitutionary sacrifice. See, we deserve that penalty, but yet Christ takes that for us and he dies. And then God looks at him, God the Father, and says, I accept that sacrifice. And he comes back to life. And for all those that put their faith, that is their reliance, their trust in Jesus, we're forgiven. We have a relationship with God. But the corporate aspect of what Christ has accomplished is that all things are being made new. The the Bible sometimes will use this language of first fruits, that we as believers are first fruits, meaning we are new creations, but it's leading to a new creation with a new heaven and a new earth. And so that's what we long for. But see, we live in the already and the not yet. See, this is the struggle that we are in. We live in the already, but the not yet. So as believers individually, we are forgiven of our sin. The Spirit of God is at work in us, but yet we still struggle with sin. We've been adopted into God's family, but all those privileges of being his children, we've not realized and enjoyed yet. We as followers of Jesus will be made new. Our world will be made new, but it hasn't happened yet, has it? And so we, along with creation, groan. We long to get back to God's good design, but we're not there yet. And what that means in our present life, because our world is still broken and not the way it should be, we will suffer in this life. But Paul says that even though we deal with suffering and hardship, we are to live with the hope of anticipation the anticipation of our future glory when we will receive new bodies, where we will live in the new heaven and the new earth. This is why Paul would say in verse 18 that that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul is not making light of your suffering at all. If you're new to the Bible and new to who Paul is, uh, he used to hate Christians. He persecuted them, but then the Lord worked in his life and he became a follower of Jesus. But when that happened, God said to him, you will suffer much for my name. And he did. He was beaten many times. He was shipwrecked. He was poor. He was left alone. People deserted him. He went through suffering. And so Paul is not making light of your suffering, but what he is saying is that our present suffering, as bad as it may be, as terrible as it may be, is not worth comparing to our future glory. Now, I want to go back to that picture of a woman in labor. You know, that is agonizing pain. But what is so uh, fascinating, so beautiful in that is, is through the pain that once the child comes, and that child, that baby boy, that baby girl is placed in the arms of the mother, what happens? You forgot all that pain, didn't you? That that child was put in your arms and all that struggle is not remembered any longer. You're holding that child. And this is a picture for us, that the struggle is real. 
It is painful at times. But when we meet Christ and we will see him face to face, our suffering, and your suffering may be awful in this life. It is not worth comparing to seeing Christ, to being with him for all time. See, our suffering is temporary. But for all eternity, we will be with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth. This is the the hope of anticipation that we are to live with. Now, as great as this hope of anticipation or our future glory is, and Paul wants this to be a motivation for us, he provides two additional uh, hopes, if you will. And that is the hope that, that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us, that is intervening for us. You know, maybe if you struggle that word intercession, it's not one we use a whole lot, but uh, maybe, you know, you had in, in a dating relationship or something at work where you just couldn't, you know, kind of figure out what to say. And you went to that person and said, hey, will you, will you handle this for me? That's a bit of a, a picture of what the Holy Spirit does for us. And so we see this hope of intercession, but also this hope of assurance that what God started in us, he will complete. So let's first of all look at the hope of intercession. We find this in verse 26. It says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I want to ask you, have you ever been in such a hard situation that you didn't know how or even what to pray? I mean, have you asked questions such as this? I'm not sure what to ask. Things are spiraling out of control. I'm so confused. I don't even know what to ask. What about this? I'm not sure I'm asking the right thing. I mean, sometimes our prayers, it's Lord, Lord, please do this. But if that doesn't happen, do this. And we're kind of all over the place. Should I stay? Should I go? We're very confused at times. What about this one? I'm not even sure I can talk. You're so distraught. Life is just weighing down on you that you sit down before the Lord and you don't even have the words. It's just this internal groan. See, what Paul is saying is is this hope of intercession is that God, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness helps us in our confusion, helps us in our uncertainty about God's will. When we say, God, how is this suffering in your will? And the Spirit searches our hearts and knows our groans, and he intervenes, and he takes that to God the Father, and he prays on our behalf. And what that means for us is that in the struggle, we continue to go to God. Even when we don't have words to say and we just sit before him, the Spirit knows our struggle, knows our groans, and he takes that and he presents it to the Father. He intercedes, he prays for us, and we take comfort that because the Spirit does that for us, that God the Father will hear him. He will provide, he will answer those prayers. You know, one of the biggest struggles when you go through suffering is you think you're doing it all alone. And from a human perspective, you may be going through it all alone. You may have nobody else to help you. I hope that's not the case. If that's you coming to our church, we have so many that that would care for you and pray for you. But if you are alone, you're actually not alone. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. The Spirit is working on your behalf. Take comfort in that. But not only that, Paul's not quite done. He gives us one more hope, and that is this hope of assurance. Look with me at verse 28. Paul continues, and he says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this is a famous verse, and sometimes what happens when these kind of verses that are so famous or or kind of so commonly known is that we can misunderstand it or maybe kind of misrepresent what the author meant. What Paul is not saying is that all things that happen are good, okay? He's not just putting this big positive spin on it. So you're faithful at your job, you get blindsided, you lose that job, that's, that's bad. Someone you love gets cancer and they die, That's bad. 
Paul is not saying those are good things. But what Paul is saying is that for those who love God, all things work together for our good. There's two I want to highlight. The, the first is that ultimately God's good purpose will be done. Now, a good example of this is found in the book of Genesis with this man named Joseph. And it's kind of a long, drawn-out story, but kind of the short version is this. When Joseph was a teenager, he had 10 other brothers. And Joseph was the favorite of his father, which is obviously going to lead to all sorts of issues. And so his brothers knew that, and they were jealous, and so they, they send him off into slavery. And they go back to their parents, and they say that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. And through all these different events, we think maybe Joseph's life's about to turn around, and then it goes bad again, and then it's going to turn around again, and, and some bad things happen. But through this series of events, Joseph finally, he actually becomes the prime minister of Egypt, second in command. And it's many years later, and Joseph's brothers show up to Egypt. And they show up because there's this really severe famine. Their family, which is about 70 people, uh, they're starving. And so they go to Egypt looking for food. And as it plays out, they don't recognize Joseph. It's been, again, many years. But then finally, Joseph tells them who he is, and they're shocked. They're, they're in fear. They think Joseph's going to kill them, and Joseph says, fear not. And then he says this, and it's so interesting. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. See, what they did was wrong and bad, but God used it for good. Maybe you've had those times and experienced that in your own life where some, some things many years later, you saw how God was working for your good. Another uh, positive was suffering. Again, things aren't always good, they, they're bad, but yet we can grow in our faith. We can grow in our trust and in our character. See, Paul would, would often say this, and, and James, for example, in his little letter would say that we go through trials, and they're hard and they're difficult, but yet they're they are conforming us into the image of Jesus. And that's great, but let's be honest. It's still hard. And even though God works all things together for his good purposes, many times we don't know how he actually did it or why. We may get to the end of our life and look at some of the sufferings that we went through and still not totally understand it. And so we may ask, Paul, how do we know this is true? For those who love God, how do we know all things work together for our good? And Paul gives the answer in verses 29 and 30. And he says this, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn from among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Notice the past tense. These verses are known as the golden chain of salvation, the golden chain of assurance. They're, they're all linked together. That those God foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified, meaning your new body with no sin for all eternity. Now, some of us hear those terms such as predestination, and we kind of want to get into that theological debate about election and all that stuff, and that's fine to have. But when Paul is writing this, he is not writing to these Christians in Rome, giving them something to debate. He's giving them theology to hold on to. He is writing to give them assurance. See, they are suffering. They are, they're going through some hard things. He wants them to be assured of God's plan for their life. And this is amazing that before God created our world, he set his love on you. It was God's plan that through his spirit, he would call you into a saving relationship with him. That our sin, we were guilty because of Christ, what he has done for us, all that is removed. We now have a new relationship with God for all eternity. This is God's plan for you before the creation of the world. Now you may be asking, have I been predestined? Have I been called? If you placed your faith in Jesus, yes. And if you've not done that, will you do that today? See, God sets his love on you. He wants you to be with him for all eternity. Eternity. 
So what Paul, as we conclude, is, is telling us is this. That in this life, we live in the already but the not yet. Where life has so many frustrations, so much suffering. We live in a broken world. But yet we have hope. We have hope that what God started in us, he will finish. We have hope that the Spirit is living in our hearts, guiding and directing us. And we live with the hope that one day all this brokenness, all the sin, all the injustice, all of it will be removed. That we will have new bodies and we will see our Savior for all time in a new heaven and a new earth that is no longer fallen and broken. And so if you are suffering today, that is the hope you are to hold on to. That you can be confident that what God started in you from eternity past, he will complete. Would you please bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. <clears throat> I want to ask you, if you've never placed your trust in Jesus... What is keeping you from doing that today? It says, for all those that turn from their sin and place our reliance not in ourselves, we can't do enough good things, but we put our reliance, our trust in Jesus, all those that do that will be saved. And when you do that, you will experience a joy and a peace as these young ladies were sharing that you didn't experience before. And you will be secure that your creator holds you and he is now your father. If that is you, we would love to pray with you in our time of invitation. For, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, where are you struggling with doubt of God's love for you? Is there suffering and some frustrations in your life that are causing you to question his commitment and love to you? Remind yourself that he is still moving and working, that one day you will be with him for all time. Know that the Holy Spirit is, is moving and working in your life even now. Trust him, rely on him, know how much he loves you. If you are suffering today and are in need of prayer, are, uh, Pastor Jack and, and Jackie, others would love to pray with you. You don't have to face it alone. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for how, you, how you've moved and worked, Lord, in our life, how, how much you love us, Lord. And Lord, we know that we will go through times and, Lord, seasons of suffering. But Lord, we ask that, that we will live with confident hope that you love us and all things will be restored. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is all made possible through your life, death, and resurrection. We praise you. We ask all in your name. Amen.